Term limits in the United States apply to many offices at both the federal and state level, and date back to the American Revolution. Term limits, also referred to as rotation in office, restrict the number of terms of office an officeholder may hold. For example, according to the 22nd Amendment, the President of the United States can serve two four year terms and serve no more than ten years. Topic: Historical background. Topic: The Constitution. Term limits date back to the American Revolution and prior to that to the democracies and republics of antiquity. The Council of 500 in ancient Athens rotated its entire membership annually, as did the Ephorate in ancient Sparta. The ancient Roman Republic featured a system of elected magistrates—tribunes of the plebs, aediles, quaestors, praetors, and consuls—who served a single term of one year, with re-election to the same magistracy forbidden for ten years see cursus honorum. According to historian Garrett Fagan, office holding in the Roman Republic was based on limited tenure of office, which ensured that authority circulated frequently, helping to prevent corruption. An additional benefit of the cursus honorum or run of offices was to bring the most experienced politicians to the upper echelons of power holding in the ancient republic. Many of the founders of the United States were educated in the classics, and quite familiar with rotation in office during antiquity. The debates of that day reveal a desire to study and profit from the object lessons offered by ancient democracy. Prior to independence, several colonies had already experimented with term limits. The Fundamental Orders of Connecticut of 1639, for example, prohibited the colonial governor from serving consecutive terms, setting terms at one year's length, and holding that no person be chosen governor above once in two years. Shortly after independence, the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1776 set maximum service in the Pennsylvania General Assembly at four years in seven. Benjamin Franklin's influence is seen not only in that he chaired the Constitutional Convention which drafted the Pennsylvania Constitution, but also because it included, virtually unchanged, Franklin's earlier proposals on executive rotation. Pennsylvania's plural executive was composed of 12 citizens elected for the term of three years, followed by a mandatory vacation of four years. The Articles of Confederation, adopted in 1781, established term limits for the delegates to the Continental Congress, mandating in Article 5 that no person shall be capable of being a delegate for more than three years in any term of six years. On October 2, 1789, the Continental Congress appointed a committee of 13 to examine forms of government for the impending Union of the States. Among the proposals was that from the state of Virginia, written by Thomas Jefferson, urging a limitation of tenure, "...to prevent every danger which might arise to American freedom by continuing too long in office the members of the Continental Congress." The committee made recommendations, which as regards congressional term limits were incorporated unchanged into the Articles of Confederation 1781-89. The fifth article stated that, "...no person shall be capable of being a delegate to the Continental Congress for more than three years in any term of six years." Topic. Term limits in the Constitution 
In contrast to the Articles of Confederation, the Federal Constitution Convention at Philadelphia omitted mandatory term limits from the U.S. Constitution of 1789. At the convention, some delegates spoke passionately against term limits such as Rufus King, who said, "...that he who has proved himself to be most fit for an office, ought not to be excluded by the Constitution from holding it." The Electoral College, it was believed by some delegates at the convention, could have a role to play in limiting unfit offices from continuing. When the states ratified the Constitution 1787 several leading statesmen regarded the lack of mandatory limits to tenure as a dangerous defect, especially, they thought, as regards the presidency and the Senate. Richard Henry Lee viewed the absence of legal limits to tenure, together with certain other features of the Constitution, as most highly and dangerously oligarchic. Both Jefferson and George Mason advised limits on re-election to the Senate and to the presidency, because said Mason, "...nothing is so essential to the preservation of a Republican government as a periodic rotation." The historian Mercy Otis Warren, warned that there is no provision for a rotation, nor anything to prevent the perpetuity of office in the same hands for life, which by a little well-timed bribery, will probably be done." <laughs> After 1789 Michael Causey says George Washington did not set the informal precedent for a two-term limit for the presidency, he only meant he was too worn out to personally continue in office. It was Thomas Jefferson who made it a principle in 1808. He made many statements calling for term limits in one form or another. The tradition was challenged by Ulysses Grant in 1880, and by Theodore Roosevelt in 1912. Otherwise, no major effort to avoid it took place until 1940 when Franklin Roosevelt explicitly broke it. The 22nd Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1951 formally establishing in law the two-term limit—although it did not apply to the incumbent Harry Truman. The fact that, "...perpetuity in office," was not approached until the 20th century is due in part to the influence of rotation in office as a popular 19th-century concept. Ideas are, in truth, forces, and rotation in office enjoyed such normative support, especially at the local level, that it altered political reality. For a detailed study of the 19th century concepts of rotation, consult Political Science Quarterly, Volume 94, House Turnover and the Principle of Rotation. By Robert Struble, Jr. See also his treatise on Twelve Lights, Chapter 6, Rotation in History. Consult also, James Young's The Washington Community, 1800-1828. According to Young, the tendency to look with mistrust upon political power was so ingrained into American culture that even the officeholders themselves perceived their occupations in a disparaging light. James Fenimore Cooper described the common view that, "...contact with the affairs of state is one of the most corrupting of the influences to which men are exposed." An article in the Richmond Enquirer 1822 noted that the "...long-cherished." principle of rotation in office had been impressed on the Republican mind, "...by a kind of intuitive impulse, unassailable to argument or authority." Beginning about the 1830s, Jacksonian democracy introduced a less idealistic twist to the practice of limiting terms. Rotation in office came to mean taking turns in the distribution of political prizes. Rotation of nominations to the U.S. House of Representatives—the prizes 
became a key element of payoffs to the party faithful. The leading lights in the local party machinery came to regard a nomination for the House as salary for political services rendered. A new code of political ethics evolved, based on the proposition that turnabout is fair play. In short, rotation of nominations was intertwined with the spoils system. In district nominating conventions local leaders could negotiate and enforce agreements to pass the nominations around among themselves. Abraham Lincoln was elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1846 under such a bargain, and he returned home to Springfield after a single congressional term because, he wrote, to enter myself as a competitor of another, or to authorize anyone so to enter me, is what my word and honor forbid." During the Civil War, the Confederate States Constitution limited its president to a single six-year term. <inaudible> <inaudible> Era of incumbency The practice of nomination rotation for the House of Representatives began to decline after the Civil War. It took a generation or so before the direct primary system, civil service reforms, and the ethic of professionalism worked to eliminate rotation in office as a common political practice. By the turn of the 20th century the era of incumbency was coming into full swing. A total of eight presidents served two full terms and declined a third and three presidents served one full term and refused a second. After World War II, however, an officeholder class had developed to the point that congressional tenure rivaled that of the U.S. Supreme Court, where tenure is for life. <laughs> term limits movement. Homesteading, or securing a lifelong career in Congress, was made possible by re-election rates that approached 100% by the end of the 20th century. The concept of homesteading brought about a popular movement known as the Term Limits Movement. The elections of 1990-94 saw the adoption of term limits for state legislatures in almost every state where citizens had the power of the initiative. In addition, 23 states limited service in their delegation to Congress. As they pertain to Congress, these laws are no longer enforceable, however, as in 1995, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned congressional term limits in U.S. Term Limits, Inc. v. Thornton, ruling that state governments cannot limit the terms of members of the national government, where rotation in the legislative branch has withstood court challenges, term limits continue to garner popular support. As of 2002, the advocacy group, U.S. Term Limits, found that in the 17 states where state legislators served in rotation, public support for term limits ranged from 60 to 78 <laughs> percent. Federal term limits As of 2013, term limits at the federal level are restricted to the executive branch and some agencies. Judicial appointments at the federal level are made for life, and are not subject to election or to term limits. The U.S. Congress remains since the Thornton decision of 1995 without electoral limits. Topic. President The third president, Thomas Jefferson, started the tradition of presidential term limits by refusing to run for a third term in 1808. Everything the first president did obviously set a precedent, but did not necessarily set a new policy. 
However George Washington's decision in 1796 not to run for a third term has sometimes been given credit as the start of a «tradition» of the strong policy that no president should ever run for a third term. Washington wanted to retire when his first term ended in 1792 but all his advisers begged him to stand for re-election. By 1796 he insisted on retiring, for he felt worn out, and was disgusted with the virulent personal attacks on his integrity. His farewell address very briefly mentioned why he would not run for a third term, and goes on to give a great deal of political advice. But he does not mention of term limits. After his death, his refusal to run was explained in terms of a no third tradition. Historian David Crockett argues, The argument for term limits has a solid and respectable pedigree. Contrary to popular belief, however, that pedigree does not begin with George Washington. Politically Washington felt the stability of the republic required a contested presidential election with a choice of candidates, which would not happen if he ran again. If he won and then died a vice president would take over who was not elected and his goal would fail. He in fact did die in 1799 two years into the new term. The election went forward and he was absolutely neutral between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. He personally did not feel bound by a two-term limit. In the 1780s, about half the states provided term limits for governors. The Constitutional Convention of 1787 discussed the issue and decided not to do so. The matter was fairly discussed in the convention. Washington wrote in 1788, and to my full convictions. I can see no propriety in precluding ourselves from the services of any man, who on some great emergency shall be deemed universally, most capable of serving the public." Even after serving two terms. The Constitution, Washington explained, retained sufficient checks against political corruption and stagnant leadership without a presidential term limits provision. Jefferson, however, strongly endorsed a policy of term limits. He rejected calls from supporters that he run for a third term in 1808, telling several state legislatures in 1807 to 1808 that he needed to support the sound precedent set by his illustrious predecessor. Thomas Jefferson mentioned that Washington retired after serving only two terms, without mentioning that Washington opposed the policy Jefferson was proposing. Crockett argues that Washington did not intentionally establish the so called two term tradition. His departure was motivated by a desire to demonstrate that the country could function without him and to retire to Mount Vernon. He made no principled argument for limiting presidents to two terms, and in fact disagreed with Thomas Jefferson on this point. The two term tradition was created in 1807 1808 and it mistakenly suggested Washington had launched the policy. In 1861 the Confederate States of America adopted a six-year term for their president and vice president and barred the president from seeking re-election. That innovation was endorsed by many American politicians after the Civil War, most notably by Rutherford B. Hayes in his inaugural address. Ulysses Grant was urged to run for a third term in 1876, but he refused. He did try for the 1880 nomination but was defeated in part because of anti-third term sentiment. Theodore Roosevelt had already served over seven years and in 1912, after a four-year hiatus, ran for a third term. 
he was violently criticized indeed almost killed by John Fleming Schrank, who was obsessed with stopping a third term. Franklin D. Roosevelt, President, 1933 to 1945, in 1940 was the only president to break the tradition, winning a third term in 1940 and a fourth term in 1944. This gave rise to a successful move to formalize the traditional two-term limit by amending the U.S. Constitution. As ratified in 1951, the 22nd Amendment provides that, "...no person shall be elected to the office of president more than twice." The new amendment explicitly did not apply to the incumbent, President Harry S. Truman, however all his close advisers, pointing to his age, his failing abilities, and his poor showing in the polls, talked him out of it. <laughs> Congress Reformers during the early 1990s used the initiative and referendum to put congressional term limits on the ballot in 24 states. Voters in eight of these states approved the congressional term limits by an average electoral margin of 2 to 1. It was an open question whether states had the constitutional authority to enact these limits. In May 1995, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled 5–4 in U.S. term limits, Inc. v. Thornton, 514 U.S. 779 1995, that states cannot impose term limits upon their federal representatives or senators. In the 1994 elections, part of the Republican platform included legislation for term limits in Congress. After winning the majority, a Republican congressman brought a constitutional amendment to the House floor that proposed limiting members of the Senate to two six-year terms and members of the House to six two-year terms. However, this rate of rotation was so slow the life-tenured Supreme Court averages in the vicinity of 12 years that the congressional version of term limits garnered little support among the populist backers of term limits, including U.S. Term Limits, the largest private organization pushing for congressional term limits. The bill got only a bare majority, 227 to 204, falling short of the two-thirds majority, 290, needed for constitutional amendments. Three other term limit amendment bills failed to get more than 200 votes, defeated in Congress and overridden by the Supreme Court. The federal term limit movement was brought to a halt. The term limits intended simultaneously to reform state legislatures as distinguished from the federal congressional delegations remain in force. However, in 15 states, in 2007, Larry J. Sabato revived the debate over term limits by arguing in a more perfect constitution that the success and popularity of term limits at the state level suggests that they should be adopted at the federal level as well. He specifically put forth the idea of congressional term limits and suggested a national constitutional convention be used to accomplish the amendment, since the Congress would be unlikely to propose and adopt any amendment that limits its own power. Some state legislators have also expressed their opinions on term limits. It is confirmed that in the following five states—and there may be others— State lawmakers approved resolutions asking Congress to propose a federal constitutional amendment to limit the number of terms which members of Congress may serve. South Dakota legislature designated as POM 42 in the U.S. Senate approved in 1989, South Dakota House Joint Resolution No. 1001 see Congressional Record of April 4, 1989, at pages 5395 and 5396, with verbatim text provided, 
Hawaii Senate, designated as Memorial 400 in the U.S. House of Representatives, approved in 1990, Hawaii Senate Resolution No. 41. Unicameral only. See Congressional Record of September 28, 1998, at page 22,655. It took eight years for this resolution to find its way into the Congressional Record and to be correctly referred to the Committee on the Judiciary. And even then, its text was not provided in the Congressional Record. Back in 1990, Hawaii's S.R. Number 41 was indeed received by the U.S. House of Representatives, and was designated as Memorial 416, Congressional Record of June 6, 1990, at pages 13,262 and 13,263, but the resolution was erroneously referred to the Committee on Energy and Commerce, and its text is not provided in the Congressional Record. Utah Legislature designated as POM 644 in the U.S. Senate approved in 1990, Utah Senate Joint Resolution No. 24 see Congressional Record of September 27, 1994, at page 26033, with verbatim text provided it took four years for this resolution to find its way into the U.S. Senate's portion of the Congressional Record. Idaho Legislature designated as Memorial 401 in the U.S. House of Representatives approved in 1992, Idaho Senate Joint Memorial No. 116 see Congressional Record of April 29, 1992, at page 9804—text not provided in the Congressional Record, and Florida Legislature designated as POM 122 in the U.S. Senate approved in 2012, Florida House Memorial No. 83 see Congressional Record of July 25, 2012, at page S5378, with verbatim text provided. Taking matters a bit further, on February 10, 2016, Florida lawmakers approved House Memorial No. 417 calling upon Congress, pursuant to Article 5 of the Federal Constitution, to assemble a convention to prepare a constitutional amendment that would establish term limits upon members of Congress. Supreme Court Legal scholars have discussed whether or not to impose term limits on the Supreme Court of the United States. Currently, Supreme Court justices are appointed for life, "...during good behavior." A sentiment has developed, among certain scholars, that the Supreme Court may not be accountable in a way that is most in line with the spirit of checks and balances. Equally, scholars have argued that life tenure has taken on a new meaning in a modern context. Changes in medical care have markedly raised life expectancy and therefore has allowed justices to serve for longer than ever before. Stephen G. Calabresi and James Lindgren, professors of law at Northwestern University, argued that, because vacancies in the court are occurring with less frequency and justices served on average, between 1971 and 2006, for 26.1 years, the "...efficacy of the democratic check that the appointment process provides on the court's membership," is reduced. There have been several similar proposals to implement term limits for the nation's highest court, including Professor of Law at Duke University, Paul Carrington's 2005, The Supreme Court Renewal Act of 2005. Many of the proposals center around a term limit for justices that would be 18 years Larry Sabato, professor of political science at University of Virginia, suggested between 15 and 18 years. 
The proposed staggered term limits of 18 years would, according to Calabresi, Lindgren 2006, and Carrington 2005, allow for a new appointment to the court every two years, which in effect would allow every president at least two appointments. Professor Carrington has argued that such a measure would not require a constitutional amendment as the Constitution doesn't even mention life tenure, it merely requires that justices serve during good behavior. The idea was not without support among judges, as John Roberts supported term limits before he was appointed to the Supreme Court as Chief Justice. Calabresi, Lindgren, and Carrington have also proposed that when justices have served out their proposed 18-year term they should be able to sit on other federal courts until retirement, death, or removal. Fairleigh Dickinson University's Public Mind poll measured American voters' attitudes towards various proposed Supreme Court reforms, including implementing term limits. The 2010 poll found that a majority of Americans were largely unaware of a proposal to impose a term limit of 18 years, as 82% reported they had heard little or nothing at all. Notwithstanding a lack of awareness, 52% of Americans approved of limiting terms to 18 years, while 35% disapproved. When asked how old is too old for a Supreme Court judge to serve if he or she seems healthy, 48% said, no limit as long as he or she is healthy, while 31% agreed that anyone over the age of 70 is too old. Some state lawmakers have officially expressed to Congress a desire for a federal constitutional amendment to limit terms of Supreme Court justices as well as of judges of federal courts below the Supreme Court level. While there might be others, below are three known examples. In 1957, the Alabama legislature adopted Senate Joint Resolution No. 47 on the subject appearing in the U.S. Senate's portion of the Congressional Record on July 3, 1957, at page 10863, with full text provided. In 1978, the Tennessee General Assembly adopted House Joint Resolution No. 21 on the subject designated as POM 612 by the U.S. Senate and quoted in full in the Congressional Record of April 25, 1978, at page 11437, and in 1998, the Louisiana House of Representatives adopted House Resolution No. 120 on the subject designated as POM 511 by the U.S. Senate and quoted in full in the Congressional Record of July 17, 1998, at page 16076. State term limits Term limits for state officials have existed since colonial times. The Pennsylvania Charter of Liberties of 1682, and the colonial frame of government of the same year, both authored by William Penn, provided for triennial rotation of the Provincial Council—the upper house of the colonial legislature. The Delaware Constitution of 1776 limited the governor to a single three year term. Currently, the governor of Delaware can serve two four year terms. At present, 36 states have term limits of various types for their governors. To circumvent the term limit in Alabama incumbent Governor George Wallace pushed through the nomination of his wife Laleen, in the 1966 Democratic primary, which was, in those days, the real contest in Alabama. It was generally understood that Mrs. Wallace would only be a titular governor while her husband continued to hold the real power. She won the election, but only served 16 months before dying in 1968. As indicated above, in 15 state legislatures the members serve in rotation, i.e., under term limits enacted during the reforms of the early 1990s. 
In another six states, however, state legislatures have either overturned their own limits or state supreme courts have ruled such limits unconstitutional. In 2002 the Idaho legislature became the first legislature of its kind to repeal its own term limits, enacted by a public vote in 1994, ostensibly because it applied to local officials along with the legislature. Gubernatorial <inaudible> <inaudible> term limits Governors of 36 states and four territories are subject to various term limits, while the governors of 14 states, Puerto Rico, and the mayor of Washington, D.C., may serve an unlimited number of terms. Each state's gubernatorial term limits are prescribed by its state constitution, with the exception of Wyoming, whose limits are found in its statutes. Territorial term limits are prescribed by its constitution in the Northern Mariana Islands, the Organic Acts in Guam and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and by statute in American Samoa. Unique in its restriction, Virginia prohibits its governors from serving consecutive terms, although former governors are re-eligible after four years out of office. Many other states formerly had this prohibition, but all had eliminated it by 2000. The governors of the following states and territories are limited to two consecutive terms, but are re-eligible after four years out of office, Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Nebraska, New Jersey, New Mexico, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, West Virginia, American Samoa, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Equivalently, the governors of Indiana and Oregon are limited to serving eight out of any 12 years. Conversely, the governors of Montana and Wyoming are limited to two terms, serving eight out of any 16 years. Finally, the governors of the following states and territory are limited to two terms for life, Arkansas, California, Delaware, Michigan, Mississippi, Missouri, Nevada, the Northern Mariana Islands, and Oklahoma. The current governor of California Jerry Brown is, however, serving a fourth non-consecutive term because his first two terms were before limits were passed in California, and the limits did not apply to individuals' prior terms. The governors of New Hampshire and Vermont may serve unlimited two-year terms. The governors or equivalent in the following states, district, and territory may serve unlimited four-year terms, Connecticut, Idaho, Illinois, Iowa, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New York, North Dakota, Texas, Utah, Washington, Wisconsin, District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. The governor of Utah was previously limited to serving three terms, but all term limit laws have since been repealed by the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> State legislatures with term limits The following 15 legislatures have term limits. Arizona Legislature, four consecutive two-year terms for both houses eight years. No limit on total number of terms. Arkansas General Assembly, 16 years total in either the House or the Senate. Prior to the 2014 election, the previous limits of three two year terms for House members six years and two four year terms for Senate members eight years applied. California State Legislature, 12 years total in either Assembly or Senate, for legislators first elected on or before June 5, 2012, the previous limits enacted in 1990 of either three two-year terms for Assembly members six years and two four-year terms for Senate members eight years apply. 
Colorado General Assembly, four consecutive two-year terms in the House eight years, and two consecutive four-year terms in the Senate eight years. Florida Legislature, may serve no more than eight consecutive years in either House. No limit on total number of terms. Louisiana State Legislature, three consecutive four-year terms for both houses 12 years. Members may run for the opposite body without having to sit out an election. Maine Legislature, four two-year terms for both houses 8 years. No limit on total number of terms. Michigan Legislature, three two-year terms for House members 6 years, and two four-year terms for Senate members 8 years. Missouri General Assembly, four consecutive two-year terms for House members eight years, and two four-year consecutive terms for Senate members eight years. Members may be elected again to the other House, but not serve more than 16 years. Montana State Legislature, four two-year terms for House members eight years in any 16-year period and two four-year terms for Senate members eight years in any 16-year period. Nebraska Legislature, unicameral legislature, members limited to two consecutive four-year terms eight years, after which they must wait four years before running again. Nevada Legislature, six two-year terms for Assembly members 12 years, and three four-year terms for Senate members 12 years. Ohio General Assembly, four consecutive two-year terms for House members 8 years, and two consecutive four-year terms for Senate members 8 years. Oklahoma Legislature, six two-year terms for House members 12 years, and three four-year terms for Senate members 12 years. Once term limited in one House, a legislator cannot be elected to the other. South Dakota Legislature, four consecutive two-year terms for both Houses 8 years. Topic: Overturned or repealed state legislative term limits. The following six legislatures have had their term limits nullified. Idaho Legislature: The legislature repealed its own term limits in 2002. Massachusetts General Court, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court overturned term limits in 1997. Oregon Legislative Assembly, the Oregon Supreme Court ruled term limits unconstitutional in 2002. See Term Limits in Oregon. Utah State Legislature, the legislature repealed its own term limits in 2003. Washington State Legislature, the Washington Supreme Court voided term limits in 1998. Wyoming Legislature, the Wyoming Supreme Court ruled term limits unconstitutional in 2004. See Term Limits in Wyoming. Municipal term limits Some local governments have term limits. In Philadelphia, the mayor cannot be elected three consecutive times, but there is no limit on how long any individual can serve as mayor. Frank Rizzo was elected mayor in 1971 and 1975. He attempted to repeal the term limit, but failed and could not run in 1979. He ran unsuccessfully for the Democratic nomination for mayor in 1983 but he lost to Wilson Good. In 1986, he switched to the Republican Party, and ran as a Republican in the mayoral elections of 1987 and 1991. Limits vary from city to city even within the same state. 
For example, Houston, Texas, has a limit of two four-year terms prior to November 3, 2015, three two-year terms dating back to 1991, while San Antonio, Texas, has a limit of four two-year terms. Both Houston and San Antonio's term limits are absolute. Elected officeholders are ineligible to run for the same position where seeking higher office is common. A two term limit was imposed on New York City Council members and citywide elected officials except for district attorneys in New York City after a 1993 referendum. See the Charter of the City of New York, Section 1138. On November 3, 2008, however, when Michael Bloomberg was in his second term of mayor, the City Council approved the extension of the two-term limit to a three-term limit. One year later, he was elected to a third term. The two-term limit was reinstated after a referendum in 2010. In Los Angeles, the mayor serves up to two four-year terms since 1993, while the city council serve up to three four-year terms. In Cincinnati, Ohio, the term limit for mayor is two successive four-year terms. Council members are limited to two successive four-year terms. There is no limit to total terms that may be served, just a limit on successive terms. In New Orleans, city council members are limited to two four-year terms. However, a council member representing one of the five council districts may run for one of the two at-large seats on the council once they reach the two-term limit, and vice versa. There is no limit on the number of terms a council member may serve in a lifetime. Since 1954, the mayor of New Orleans has been limited to two consecutive four-year elected terms, but he or she may be elected again after sitting out one four-year term. When the new city plan of government was adopted, the mayor at the time, Delesip's Story Morrison, was exempt from term limits due to a grandfather clause. Under the original Metropolitan Charter adopted in 1962, the mayor of Nashville was limited to three consecutive four-year terms, which was subsequently reduced to two consecutive four-year terms in 1991. Councillors were likewise limited to two consecutive four-year terms, but subsequent court rulings have determined the offices of district councillor and at-large councillor to be separate offices even though all councillors serve together in one unicameral body, which has meant that at-large councillors have continued in office as district members, and more frequently, district councillors have been elected to subsequent terms as at-large councillors. Topic. See also Notes of debates in the Federal Convention of 1787 List of political term limits Political class Second Constitutional Convention of the United States